Welcome back. This is part two of our three-part video module series on social-emotional engagement, knowledge and skills, also referred to as SEEKS. And in this session, we're going to handle the what. What instructional strategies can we implement in our natural routines and literacy-based instruction to fuel language development, literacy development, and our students' learning? If you haven't already watched the why, which is part one, I highly recommend you go back and start there, but otherwise, let's join in together. So we have a three-part course going right now. We've already completed part number one, which is the why. We reviewed the current neuroscience of, and how that shows us that social emotional engagement is a powerful fuel for healthy brain development, language development, and literacy. We addressed a freely accessible tool for measuring student engagement that was shared with all of the participants. Now we're going on to part two, which is the what. Whereas if we identify opportunities for enhancing engagement using our social engagement ladder, let's figure out a way to adjust our instructional strategies to foster student investment, student independence, and student initiation. So in this part of this three-part course, we're going to review a freely accessible quick reference tool for what strategies could be embedded within our literacy instruction to fuel our learning. So here's the what part of this. And that goes down to the what instructional strategies do we use to enhance student engagement? In part one, we introduced this idea that if we want a child's brain to be turned on, lit up with excitement about whatever learning standard we're accomplishing at that moment, we need to make sure we've got their investment. The emotional regions of their brain are lit up because we've stimulated their interest in learning and figured out ways to help them sustain their investment. And there are many different strategies that we use to get the emotional hook. Then we need to make sure the back of the brain really gets this, really understands the academic concepts, the instructions, and the social expectations so that student can be as independent as possible. We have to present information in multiple ways to make sure that they can be as independent as possible. And then finally, initiation. Let's get the frontal lobes involved and let's get our kids showing us what they know, either with their peers or with their teachers. But to do so, we need to give them many different ways to let us know what they know whether we encourage their gestures, their facial expressions, their written communication, visuals, whatnot. We're gonna make sure they have lots of different ways to initiate with us. And so how SEEKS comes in to play with the Universal Design for Learning framework is that we make sure you have a quick reference tool or a toolkit so that you match up the instructional strategies to the developmental level of your students. You may mostly serve conversational level students who have full conversational language, and there are still gonna be strategies that we need to focus on to enhance their investment, independence, and initiation. But there are students that might have language vulnerabilities, maybe subtle, maybe not even diagnosed to language vulnerabilities. If you're having any difficulty with engagement or seeing opportunities, I should say, we're gonna to wanna to hang out in the emerging language section where we provide a bit more hands-on, more visual supports, role play, rehearsal, and so forth to enhance engagement. And finally, you might actually have some students who are before words, who enter into the school system or to your preschool programs or are still in your elementary school programs but receiving special education services who are not yet talking, not using picture symbols or any other form of symbolic communication. We've got to still figure out how do we get them engaged in learning? How do we get the emotional hook, the independence and the initiation? So in part one, I introduced to you the SEEKS Quick Reference Tool. This, this materials are also in your handout materials that come along with these video modules. So hopefully they're in front of you right now and you can see that you've got section A, which is fostering investment, section B, which is fostering in independence, and then finally section C, which is fostering initiation. And then what it, how it's organized is such that you would have to be quickly referencing how do I provide strategies for investment, independence, and initiation if I have a student in my classroom or in my natural routine that's before words, a child who might be younger, who are developmentally younger, who you need to provide a bit more contextual information, making sure that when you're, you're moving from one activity to the next, we provide a lot more obvious indicators, whether it be the lights turning off or music and hand, um, handing them actual real life objects representing the upcoming activities versus as they're emerging language kids, we can bring a little bit of role play, imaginative play, still use some hands-on material, uh, materials and contextual cues. And as we move up to contextual, or I'm sorry, conversational stage, we're gonna use more visuals, more, more written communication and so forth for them to understand expectations. 
So this helps us gauge where do we need to be, it, depending on an individual student's developmental stage, but it's about how do we design that universal lesson plan so all of our children can be successful. So let's get on to the discussion of investment. So when we look at investment, our goal is to turn on the lights in the emotional regions of the brains of our students, of our learners. We want to get the emotional hook, the, you know, the, the stimulate their interest and then sustain their interest. We have a mentorship tool that we're going to learn a lot more about when we get to part three of this three part series. But for now, you can certainly have it open and available to you so that you can see when we go and watch each other, whether we're watching another caregiver, a teacher, an educator, we're going to look and see how is this individual and how is this setting stimulating the motivation for learning? What has this learning environment done to provide real life application, hands on materials, whole body movement, humor, competition, and how has it been developmentally tailored to the level of language of that student? And also, do students have or learners have the tools to stay actively engaged and persist in that activity? So that's what we mean by getting the investment. Have we stimulated their interest and how are we keeping them hooked throughout this lesson? Now that's going to look different depending on the developmental stage of the child. And so we're going to look at each developmental stage in this module just to give you a couple of examples. And so in this first th section of investment right here, we're going to look at what can we do to stimulate motivation for learning and how do we give the tools to stay actively engaged and persist in any given activity or classroom literacy based instruction. First, we're going to start off with the before word stage. So those of you who are working with very young children or children that might have significant vulnerabilities as they are chronologically older may have a student in your learning environment that's not yet talking doesn't have speech yet, does not yet have picture symbols or sign language. So potentially the language regions of the brain have not yet developed. And so if that's, that's not where they are neurodevelopmentally, if you want to get them invested and, and hooked on staying with you and going back and forth into interaction, I would give you a quick hint of probably what's not going to work. And that's talking to them a lot because they don't understand that language. But if you really want to get them hooked and engaged in your lesson, we're going to start with hands-on materials, gross motor movement, contextual support. We're going to make sure that we keep our kids engaged at the stage by giving them things to hold in their hands and manipulate, perhaps something that is soothing or stimulating to them. We're going to make sure we have alternative seating so that maybe they're not sitting very long because sitting and listening to someone's really hard, but they're bouncing instead or they have a special seat that's comfortable to them that keeps them engaged. And then we're going to adjust the social complexity because if this young person is not yet using language to communicate, they may not be that so sure about people and overwhelming if you have more than two or three or four or five people around might be really challenging. So having an adjusted social complexity is key to keeping the investment of kids who are before words. So let's take a look at what we can do to fuel investment in a before word student. First and foremost, we're going to embed in our any kind of literacy based instruction or just relationship connection instruction, hands on materials, messy play, exploration with different textures, things like art, building, cooking, music, and as you see on the far right here, some water play. In the far left here, what you're noticing is a child who's doing some paper mache. Now that's a young person who's before words, but happens to be in a classroom that is kindergarten age students. And the general ed mainstream teacher said, if I've got the student coming in for some partially inclusive opportunities, I want to get him hooked on learning. So every time he comes into my classroom, I'm careful to know there's got to be hands-on materials on the table. So he usually comes in during our social studies lessons where we're learning about things like Earth Day or Planet Earth. And rather than just having us do a worksheet on all the different facts we can learn about Planet Earth, let's do some paper mache. Let's get our hands, you know, kind of messy and, and playful. And when he walks in, he goes right to those materials. Now, my conversational level kindergartner kids, they don't mind. That seems to get their emotional hook as well. So making sure we have those materials accessible is a key component of enhancing instructional in, in strategies to enhance investment. I put this one here because water in every form appears to be something that gets us engaged. And the frozen cube, even better if you get the serve and volley and serve and volley with one's peers. You can push the cube, they push it back, they go back and forth and back and forth, and we get that connection going. 
Um, so these are just some examples of what we can embed in lessons to get our um, before word students emotionally invested. So here's an example of a very young child who's before words. One of the things I mentioned before was music. If we want our children to be emotionally connected to us, feeling it through their whole body is often a really powerful strategy. So what you'll notice here is that this is actually a caregiver and a, and a mentor with a, a very small child. And she's just learning her words. So she's just at that edge of early development of language acquisition. And they're embedding gross motor movement and they're embedding music to foster her ability to serve in volley and serve in volley with her social partners right here. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. Oh. Oh. Good boy. Yay. 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 Here's it again. Okay, a ring around the rosy. Let's not say down this time and let her try it. Ring around the rosy, pocket full of posy. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so as you can see that brought pure joy to my face right there this is a child who's still developing her language hemispheres of her brain but the music the gross motor movement seemed to stimulate her interest in wanting to be with people and wanting to connect that way and so those are going to be strategies that we're going to always think about with our before words children regardless of what chronological age they are. If they're 15 and they're at the before word stage, we're probably going to need to do some movement, some dancing, some music, and really get that connection in that book. So let's think about the emerging language students. These are children who may come into our preschool with some language, but just not fully, you know, conversational. They are talking, but they struggle with people's names and verbs and nouns. And so they, they have language delays, or they're just at that emerging language stage to begin with. So what do we provide for them to get the emotional hook? We make sure that they have, that whenever we read to them, when we're sounding out words and we have student, we, we think about students acting out or role playing the meaning of that word to share their knowledge with another peer. So that role play and that acting out is really key because if they don't understand the words and they're, you're asking them to imitate them, if they can flap their wings because we're talking about fly or we're saying the letter I and we compare it with some action, that makes it that much more meaningful to a child with a language delay. So role play and movement, hands-on meaningful materials, gross motor movement, and then contextual support. So embedding whatever we're doing into real life activities. And then lastly, but not leastly, visuals, 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 things that help them connect what they're hearing and saying to actual real life materials in the environment. Um, so this is some of the things that we would do for our emerging language students. So here is a teacher who just read to her preschoolers a book called Very Hungry Caterpillar. You're gonna hear a lot about that book today. And this is by, obviously by Eric Carle. And so they've got to learn that the caterpillar eats a lot. All the fruit and, and leaves and things that the caterpillar eats turns in, you know, creates a cocoon and metamorphosizes into a butterfly. So how might we foster investment? Well, you're going to see this teacher embedding some role play. So these little, these little students become caterpillars. But then as they metamorphosize, they flap their wings and literally fly around the room to become butterflies themselves. Then when they sit back down at the desk, they recreate it again by making cocoons out of building blocks. And so they're creating the actual materials after they've read the story in the book. So the book comes to life. And when you're doing that for emerging language kids, it helps reinforce the language has meaning and connects them all together. Oh, I think these right here are different. Ooh, they
And we are going to the bill. Oh, going to the bill. Oh, yes, you can go. Then I know what she did. You can use to make yours. Make yours hard. I want to make mine small. Make it hard. 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 Make it the story that they read is still right on that table as a centerpiece for them to understand. We've read the material here. Now we're recreating the story through role play and hands-on materials. And not only did we stimulate their interest to begin with, but we've sustained their interest throughout the whole activity through gross motor movement, then shifting to fine motor and hands-on activities. And so this is an example of instructional strategies that we may already use and can also think about using for our emerging language students to get emotionally invested in the activity. So now let's take a shift and think about conversational level students. So these are students who do have the ability to communicate primarily through compound sentence structures, conversational level discourse. We are going to link meaningful topics and materials to their tasks. So there's clear application to daily life. That seems to stimulate their interest when we do that. Now it's okay to still have hands-on materials, gross motor movement, and some contextual support. But we'd also shift over to embedding discussion prior to the task is what might be helpful when in need of help so they can sustain their engagement throughout the activity. So we're gonna, we're gonna let them know what to expect. We're gonna get them hooked because it's real life. There's role play, there's meaningfulness. We've connected all that. And then we also help them sustain engagement through giving them tools to stay, to stay connected throughout the lesson. Here's an example, actually in a fifth grade classroom, of a teacher who fostered investment in her writing lessons. She connected it with her social studies curriculum, so she interwove those curriculum standards together. So they were learning actually about Civil War history and actually post-Civil War and who assassinated Abraham Lincoln. So she created her room into a, an, a, into a fantasy role play essentially. Even the door looked intimidating said, keep out, caution, don't even bother coming in here because there is a crime scene investigation going on in this classroom. There are clues as to who assassinated Abraham Lincoln all over the classroom. And if your group is, is chosen to investigate clue number one, clue number two, clue number three, you have to write down everything that you think this clue tells you about the scenario of who assassinated Abraham Lincoln. So this is a literacy activity. It's one in which requires a great deal of thought and, and consideration as to how to organize your topic paragraphs and how to organize your, uh, your evidence and your writing. These students, however, are hooked. And not only are they hooked, but they're sustaining their investment throughout the task. You'll notice that not only is there decoration in the room, but the students themselves are in costume. Some of them are wearing safety goggles. They're wearing latex gloves. They've gotten into the full mode of being detectives here. It may be hard to see on your screen, but hopefully you're seeing the chalk lines of the murder scene of Abraham Lincoln, the, the gruesome concept here. Um, this is where the actual murder occurred, but you will see clues pasted around the classroom as well as students are writing about those clues. You can see the footprints, you can see the latex gloves, the safety goggles, and you can hear the chatter of the students talking about whether their clue is relevant to the assassination. I always like to beg to differ that that actual footprint was something you might see in the 19th century, but that's just my personal opinion <laughs> and me being a detective myself. I'm hooked, I'm interested, I want to know more about this particular learning standard and I want to write about it too. So what I've just shared with you is just some different strategies that we have in our Seek's Quick Reference tool for the before words kiddos, the language, emerging language stage students, and then the conversational students. So this is your time to reflect. In part one of our three-part series, you already wrote down a number of strategies that you already used to fuel investment. So now I really want you to take the time to pause the recording, take a look at section A of the Quick Reference tool that's in your materials, and then write down some of the strategies that you already use to enhance investment in your literacy instruction. 
you may find very affirming information in here. You may find things that you're already doing in your lessons. But I want you to remember to come back to these particular resources when you're seeing a student who there might be an opportunity to increase their investment. It's in your toolkit. We just bring that portion of the lesson plan back in. Let's get more hands-on. Let's get more gross motor. Let's tie in some more real life, imaginative role play and things like that. We might be able to enhance more investment from that particular student or that group of students. So go ahead and pause the recording for a few moments, read section A and write down some of the strategies that you feel you're already doing to enhance literacy instruction. So welcome back. Hopefully you took some time to reflect and you paused your, your recording and thought about investment. If you're looking for additional strategies to fuel student investment in your classrooms, definitely look at section A and think about the different developmental stages and how we can enhance our lesson plans to fuel our engagement in literacy instruction in our classrooms. So we're gonna shift to section B which is all about an independence. Let's get the back of the brain totally on board with what we're trying to teach our students. We need deep comprehension and the best way to do that is to provide information in multiple ways so our students really understand what's expected and understand the concepts that we're teaching to them. In your mentorship tool, so this is your mentorship form that's in your materials. We're gonna learn more about that again in part three of this video module series. There are two questions that we're gonna ask ourselves as well as our peers when we observe them. Do students have access to information presented in different ways? For example, everything from a written to-do list, a checklist, you know, graphic organizers, photographs, multiple media, role play, teacher modeling, peer modeling, manipulatives, real life materials. There's so many different ways to present information. So when we're designing our instruction, we need to be thinking about how am I gonna get the back of the brain of this kid on board? What, are they, what am I doing to show them really the meaning of, of the concepts? And then if I'm giving instructions, do they have multiple ways of understanding? We also look at social expectations and whether or not those are being presented in multiple ways. For example, if we would like them to stand in line and distance themselves in a particular manner, it'd be nice sometimes to have the footprints on the floor. Um, that, that's a simple example of how might we support their independence with following those social expectations. So in your SEEKS Quick Reference Tool, fostering independence is at the bottom of that first page, but also carries on to the second part of um, the, the back page of it too. So there's two sections under B number one, are students having access to information presented in different ways? And we're gonna look at what that looks like for before words, emerging language, and conversational level students. So first, take a look at the before words section. These are children who you may see in your classroom environments or natural routines who are not yet talking, who are not yet using speech, picture symbols, sign language, or other forms of symbolic communication. Going back to what we learned in part one, they haven't formed the language hemispheres of their brain yet. So if we want to, them to be as independent as possible, we're gonna need to, we're gonna need to pair our uh, verbal information with contextual support, embedding language in natural routines using concrete visual tools. If we want them to understand where we're going next, we're gonna hand them an actual object. We're going to the art table, here's the art, the paintbrush. We're going to have a, a meal, here is a, a, a plate for you to hold. If we're gonna read a book about um, ducks, we're gonna hold a duck in our hand, <laughs> a little plastic duck, of course. We might even have some water in front of that child. So the more we can compare it with real life experience, the stronger we're gonna be at um, supporting their independence with knowing what the expectations are. As you will see here, objects of reference to support transitions across activities are, is a key component to help independence as this child flows throughout our school day and between literacy-based instruction and other activities of the school day. So let's go ahead and take a look at that in action here. Okay. And here's an example in a preschool age child of a staff member not only providing a picture symbol for this child to understand they're supposed to come in from playtime into the classroom environment for a meal activity prior to their literacy based instruction. And you'll see the young person is also given not just a, a, a two dimensional symbol that says it's mealtime, but a see through container that actually has some of his favorite snack items in it. So he sees it and goes, oh, it's time to go inside. And that concrete object can help a child support his, support his understanding and therefore his independence in making that transition. 
The video I'm going to share with you of this young person starts where they first they ring a bell and says it's time for insides. That's a contextual support. Then they verbally say it's time to go inside. And neither of those really make an impact on his independence. It's not until the person comes up to him with a visual, visual picture symbol paired with an actual object of reference do you see him independently turn and make that transition on his own. Now he willingly left the slide and started heading inside to, to the next activity, which shows a signal of his independence. Now I giggle because the teacher still took his hand and started walking with him. And I, I, I kind of I teased her a little bit and said, what are you doing taking her hand? I thought we were working on his independence. And she goes, you mean I can't hold a child's hand just because I want him to be independent? And I was like, oh, of course you can hold a child's hand. It's a comfort, it's a form of connection, all that wonderfulness. But if you're pulling, if you actually feel yourself pulling a child, that's not an instructional strategy that supports independence, that's coercion. <laughs> and so we need to pause and say, hmm, if I'm pulling, how might I increase the student's independence? What additional visual support can I provide for them? What else can I provide? So really be thinking about that. If this child is having to be physically moved around, that means they don't understand. And that means we as educators should provide information in, in multiple ways so that they can be more successful. We're gonna shift now though to talking about emerging language students. So what do we do when children are developing the language hemispheres of their brain? They may be in our preschool classroom. If we follow this arrow down to emerging language, fostering independence, we're gonna pair our verbal information with photos, with graphics, the written word, but also some contextual information. So we're going to uh, make sure that information is embedded in natural routines like re that involve rehearsal and role play, sort of acting out what we've just read in a story or acting out what the, expo uh, you know, the expectations are of a given situation. And so the first activity I wanna share with you here is actually with a group of Head Start students who are learning how to brush their teeth. And this teacher happens to be with all 18 of them right now. And she's going to go into a very small bathroom where they all have their individual toothbrushes line up. So imagine she wants them to be pretty independent because how can she help each individual one understand the expectations? So this is an example of how do we get the back of the brain understanding what they're going to be doing in just a moment so that when they get there, they can use what they've learned to fuel their independence. So she's going to use role play and music to help them understand and foster their independence. Brush, brush, brush your teeth, brush your hair every day. You have a to face on your brush and have a plan to the cake. Give yourself a hand. You did good this morning. Thank you so much. I have a sense that as they make their way over to brush their teeth, that that's in their mind, and therefore they will be a lot more independent with that particular skill that they're learning right there. So how about we go to a literacy rug time in our classrooms? We want to make sure that the back of the brain is there so that they can be more independent coming to the rug. And then once they're sitting on the rug with their 20 peers, and we want them to, you know, learn the poems that we're going to read, learn some phonemic awareness, you know, understand language concepts. Let's make sure we provide visuals for the sequence and the steps within the activity. So this kindergarten teacher, she's got her daily agenda posted on the front wall with very clear written language supports paired each with a graphic so that the children understand what calendar time is, what sounds are, what word study is. And so they know what they're gonna be doing across the day. And as they finish each one, they slide it over to the left and then the next one is called up. So they can tell just by looking at that schedule where they're supposed to be at that moment. Then she to create something called a help box. A help box is a visual support that helps children understand what we get to do right now. So right next to the daily schedule, she's got a little thing that says, check here for help if you ever need it, to know what we're gonna be doing when we come to literacy time on the rug. We're gonna do a song that's probably about the, the poem or the book we've just read. We're gonna do a poem, a new poem today. 
we're going to do puppets related to that poem, and then we're going to sing another song, probably related to that poem or the book that they've read. So all of these things are deeper understanding of, of the concepts being taught in the poem, for example. But the children also know, I'm going to do four things on the rug today. Once I finish number one, which is the song, we're going to do our poem. Once the poem is done, we're going to get to do the puppets. This is fostering their independence throughout the activity. So today we are going to sing a song. What are we going to do? Sing, sing a song. song. And then we're going to do a poem. What are we going to do? A, a, poem. a poem. And you know what? It's new. It's a new poem. It's oh, it's so exciting. What? You're going to find out. You're excited. Number three. Oh, thank you so much, Abigail. Number three, we are going to talk about our puppets. What are we going to do? Puppets. And we've got ones that are the five little ducks, right? Okay. And then when we're done, we're, after we do our puppets, we're going to sing another song. We're going to sing a song. So even after all that information, you have that curious child that says, why are there two sings? He was referring to the two songs, one at the beginning and one at the end. He needed more information for the back of his brain so he could be independent in the long run. He just wanted to clarify what song are we going to sing first and what song are we singing at the end. Um, you'll also notice, by the way, that after they finish this kind of language-based task where you've got, you're showing them the real function of literacy, which is to organize your mind and help you understand what the expectations are, that she still has them stand up and use that gross motor movement to stimulate their investment in doing what they're about to do. They're not just going to sing, but they're going to sing while they stand. Again, to keep that emotional region of the brain hooked as long as we, as in addition to supporting their independence here. So here's another example at the emerging language stage. So you would like the students to be more independent with say taking their turns with one another in, an, in a task that's tied into a story that you've just read, like they're going to feed the frogs today because they just read about the five little spe speckled frogs. Well, four of them just joined this small group literacy activity and there's a, a visual support called a turn-taking dial on the table. Next to the turn-taking dial is a selection of photographs of all of the children in the class. So they get to take their photograph off and stick it on the turn taker dial so they know they will have a turn. And this is helping them use their language as well as their early literacy to understand kind of the rotation. It's going to be Bennett's turn first and then it's going to be my turn. And that's going to support their independence using that language and literacy to help them with being able to turn take within the classroom. This particular video I smile about as I watch this teacher implement this because it's one of the first times she's done it. And by the time she sits down to get organized, um, you will notice that they've already got the turn taking dial all sorted out and they're ready to go. I believe they're going to be um, putting buttons onto the sweaters that represent Pete the Cats and his four groovy buttons. Um, so this is an activity related to a story they've just done and read aloud. Are you getting everybody out there for me? hear the surprise in the teacher's voice saying these kids know what turn-taking sequence they're going to be in because the tools were provided for them before I even sat down and now what they're about to do is again they're each going to get a little sweater that represents Pete the cat and they're going to put the four groovy buttons back on that poor cat that just lost his buttons before um, if you don't know what book I'm referring to we showed this at the end of um, the first part of our three-part series here 
So I'm going to shift us now to the conversational stage. How do we fuel independence in our classroom lessons for conversational level students? If you follow that arrow down, it says, you know what, we're still going to need visual supports. We need written language, photographs, graphics, like a to-do list, those help boxes. But role play and rehearsal can still really be helpful as well, along with other kind of visuals and tools and written information to support transitions between activities and to understand academic concepts in general. So I'm going to take you into a fifth grade where they are learning narrative writing. And we as literacy based instructors know the power of presenting information in different ways to fuel understanding and independence. This particular teacher, she's got a visual up on her smart board that, as you can see, gives them the clear expectations for the task itself. We're going to do writing right now. Here's the date. Here's our to do list. We're going to write about the Boston massacre or the Boston Tea Party. How are we going to do that? We're going to use our narrative graphic organizer and then we're going to type our narrative at the end. And the good news is we get to work in groups of two or three. It even tells you what items you're going to need for this task. And it reminds you of your vocal volume level, where we actually should be versus where we actually are. So all of this visual support is helping children be independent with the writing process. Um, the actual task of narrative writing embedded um, with the social studies standard of understanding the Boston massacre and the Boston Tea Party, again, fuels the investment regions of the brain. But these children are learning, how do I make sure I've got the opening in there, the rising action, the climax, the falling action on the roller coaster of a story? How do I write a narrative? And we're going to work together in small groups to brainstorm what that story is going to look like to summarize the Boston Massacre or the Boston Tea Party, that whatever theme I've ch chosen. So let me just show you a group of, of um, students that is working on this, using this visual support to support, support their independence. They call in this stud in main version. Two more died later from a So that's five and two. Right? It looks like there's buildings, so we can be like watching out of our building like tablets. No, no. Right actually. You're gonna be like the one watching back and be like one in there. Like trying to signal me to come out. Aren't you going to be like a kid? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Or I can well, be You would just be in one of those buildings looking out for the After the incident, the crowd was eventually dispersed by the acting of Governor of Boston, Thomas Hutchins. So what you saw there were two young students independently problem solving, how to create a narrative that best captures, whether they're talking about the Boston Massacre or the, um, um, the Tea Party at this particular moment, how are they gonna capture the emotion, the rising climax that, you know, and then you know, the events rising up to the climax that kind of on the end, and you'll hear them actually discussing, I'm gonna be a character standing in one of these buildings. They access the photographs that the teacher provided for them so they could be more independent with thinking about what it might be like to be in that moment right there. I'm gonna be in that building. The child next to him says, are, and are you gonna be like a kid calling for help in the middle of this massacre? And he, she goes, he goes, yes, that might be a good climax part of the thing. And they are creating their own narrative that they can write to integrate the events of that particular history. Um, so what you saw here is that this is a group that has their narrative graphic organizer, they have their peer to work with, they have photographs to work with, and they're figuring out independently how to accomplish that narrative writing. So I want you to take some time to look at section B of the six Seeks Quick Reference Tool and actually think about what we reflected even in part one of this series is what do you already do to fuel independence in your learners? How do you provide role play? How do you provide visuals or real life materials? What tools are you using to foster independence? Then I want you to read section B and write down any of the strategies you may already be using, maybe new ones that you wanna try. So you're really taking away strategies to fuel independence. If you're by yourself or in a small group, I'd encourage you to take about five minutes for this activity and encourage you to pause the recording during this reflection time. So hopefully you engaged in that reflection. If not, you're powering on and you're looking for additional strategies to support student independence. 
in classroom lessons, you're going to want to look at the bottom of that first page and the top of the back side of the SEEKS quick reference tool to think about many different ways we can present information in different ways dependent on a child's language level and understanding. That leads us to the final section of strategies that we use to enhance in engagement in our classroom literacy-based instruction, and that is fostering expression, or what we refer to as initiation. Can we make sure that our students are showing what they know, that they're communicating their thoughts and feelings with their peers and teachers around them? This is the frontal lobes in action. On our mentorship tool, which is in your printed materials, hopefully, you will be looking at two questions. Are our students being given different options to show what they know and what to say? So they have different ways to communicate. Are we eliciting responses through their gestures, thumbs up, thumbs down? Are we encouraging them to use written responses, visuals, technology? Maybe there's real life material that they just have to hold up and show to us. So different options is a key component. Then question number two is, are students given frequent opportunities to initiate in everyday activities? Are we doing too much teacher-led discussion? Maybe we need to embed more turn and talks, maybe giving them a chance to initiate with their peer or with others. If they're very young children, are we giving them opportunities simply by honoring their nonverbal facial expressions and their, and their body language as a means to initiate? So opportunities is both as one part and options is the other. So let's look at our quick reference tool, that is section C, and that's on the back side of your SEEKS quick reference. And of course we have different strategies, whether children are before words, emerging language, or conversational. Starting with our before words children, which again may not be in your classroom, but we wanna make sure that we're being inclusive of every learner that we might have at, at one point in our learning environments. We have a child come in who doesn't yet find um, you know, the use of speech, pictures, and sign language at their access. We're going to make sure that we're planning and providing options for them to communicate by giving them actual materials to hold. So we might give them an object and they hold it up toward us as a way to communicate. We could put them in see-through containers too. So if we gave them choices and they're all in see-through containers, they just have to touch the containers or hand the containers to us. That's the beginning of a way of showing them, showing you what they know. So actual hands-on uh, materials is gonna be a key component. Providing adjusted social complexity. So making sure that we are not overwhelming a child who doesn't have a lot of language with a large group environment. Um, that's gonna make sure that they have opportunities to initiate and that we are really responsive to their nonverbal signals for communication, because if they don't have language, their body language is their language. So we need to give them words for what they're trying to communicate to us. And of course, close proximity to concrete objects and see-through containers are gonna be a key component there. So let me show you an example of a, a, preschool or a preschool classroom here, where they have just read, we're going on a bear hunt. And there's a young child in here with um, actually the far right corner on the on closest to us, who was just coming into this classroom with minimal language. And this teacher made sure that in many of her literacy-based activities, she would give them actual objects to hold related to the story. So they've just read, we're going on a bear hunt, and now they're role-playing, we're going on a bear hunt, which the emerging language students are all like, yes. But the children who are before words have an actual, you know, teddy bear in their hand. And that way they can initiate by doing with the teddy bear any imitation. They can reach out with others. Holding that actual object it seems to encourage their spontaneous communication. A snowstorm. A snowstorm. A snowstorm. A snowstorm. A snowstorm. We can't go. Can't go over it. Hold your bears out. Under it. Hold them down. Oh, Isaiah, we're gonna go through it, ready? Oh, no. Hold your hand out, it's gonna blow in your face. Oh, the snow is everywhere. Oh, 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 I don't know about you, but I want to go and do the we're going on a bear hunt with that teacher right now. Um, so she's got my emotional investment, but the other thing that she's got is a way for every kid to be able to communicate whether they have language or not, because they have something in their, in their hands um, that is allowing them to communicate. So let's move to the emerging language stage. Are we planning and providing options for children who have some language delays by providing duplicate sets of materials? That's kind of a key area here. So if we're in a group literacy-based instruction, they've got a visual support on their lap that they can follow along with. 
because if they have language delays, they may not speak, but they can point to different things on the visuals in front of them. They can hold things up. You know, that visual support is going to be a key lifeline to providing an option as well as an opportunity for children to initiate when they don't have as much language. So the first example I'm going to show you here is in, back in our favorite classroom that we've already seen several times. They are reading The Very Hungry Caterpillar right now, and each of them has a popsicle stick in their hand that represents something that that caterpillar might eat. So when she turns the page, actually she doesn't turn the page, one of the students is turning the page for her, and they see what the caterpillar is eating now. If they're holding the strawberries, they get to hold up the strawberries. If they're holding the blueberries, they just have to hold up the blueberries. And what you'll see is that it requires very little verbal communication. They have a different option to show what they know. Um, the children are also hearing um, modeling of person verb noun sentence structure as children's names are called out as they hold up each of the individual food items the caterpillar is eating. He started to look for some food. On Monday he ate through one apple but he was still on Tuesday, he Happy. ate through two pears. Who got the pears? Mm -hmm. Jaden. But he was still hungry. On Wednesday, he ate through three plums. Who got, got the plums? You got to hold all three plums up. Okay. But he was still hungry. hungry. On Thursday, he ate through four strawberries. Who got the strawberries? Kanaya got the just Jordan. Jordan got the strawberries, but he was still hungry. You can I noticed the high affect of the teacher, the close proximity of the students the turning page child who was in charge of turning the page and then each of them having their own individual role and different ways to communicate. Some children are shouting out and using verbal language. Others are just holding up their popsicle stick. And so they have different options to show what they know to get their frontal lobe going and show their active engagement through their initiation. And in this classroom, I wanted you to see the power of a proximal visual. Proximal meaning something the child can hold. The teachers at the front doing, I think, the hi-ho, the Dario song paired with how do you spell black, B-L-A-C-K spells black, um, something, something along those lines. But each child having the visual in their hand allows them to point along to the song. So you'll notice the child in the front row with the blonde hair. He's just initiating the whole entire time. That's the B, that's the L, that's the A, that's the C. I can see my letters and I'm showing you what I know. If he was sitting there with no proximal visual, very different environment. So these instructional strategies are real powerful to foster initiation. Young child close to us has minimal, minimal verbal language, but he's looking and shifting his gaze between his board and the teacher's materials as well. It was an armor, had a cat and black was his name. I apologize, it wasn't Hi Ho Dario, it was a bingo uh, um, musical theme here. But as you see, each of those child having their own visual support, they're tapping along as they go, giving them a different option to show what they know than just verbally singing along to a very fast page, very complicated phonemic song right here. They can follow along and show what they know. So if you're doing, whether it's you know, phonemic awareness activities, if they've got a visual in front of them on their lap that they can point to different sounds while they're saying it, that's one strategy that we've seen that seems to foster a great deal of initiation. This is another similar activity. We're going more for the academic concept or the understanding of the language of a story that was just read to them. They just learned about animal habitats in a, ch in a children's book about where animals live. And so this teacher's got in front of every one of them a little folder that has all of the animals, you know, Velcroed and laminated in there. And when they, when they sing about 
the, the ladybug or the squirrel that they're just talking about, they take their squirrel off and stick them in the proper animal habitat on the inside of the folder. So these children can show what they know by taking off their picture and putting it to the right spot in their folder, or they can conversationally chat out with you about where the squirrel is going to sleep. They can chat about it, but you can see they have lots of different options to show what they know throughout this activity. Ready? Alex, let me see your animals. That's right. Oh, Molly's making him climb a tree to get in his nest. Yeah, Molly's going. In my tree. And put him in your nest. Grant, where's your squirrel? Where is he? It's been he can't see my tail. All right, when you're done, shut your folder so I know you're ready. Ready. All right. Hibernate, hibernate. Who sleeps under a leaf? Who is it? Ladybug. Yes. Ladybug, she's so snug underneath her leaf. Get your ladybug, and where do you put it? And her leaf. Under her the leaf. leaf. Alex, you got it? Pull it up. He's climbing the tree, too? Oh, Molly. Good job. When you're done, shut your folder so I know you're ready. Ready. As they're going through each of the animals or insects that they've just learned about, ladybug she is so snug underneath the leaf. They show what they know by putting the ladybug underneath the leaf. And then you hear the children shouting out, the squirrel is sleeping. That's the ladybug, lives under the leaf. And so it's providing all of this visual support to encourage more initiation and showing what they know. Um, these visual supports sometimes are difficult to create because they take a lot of preparation and things like this. This teacher has assured me she does this every single year with the same storybook that she reads about animal habitat. So once you create them, hopefully you can reuse them and reuse them. If, if this is a little bit more desirable, just the simple visual where it's just pointing to different things, this is a lot more practical to be able to just point to different things and follow along with the story that way. In either case, these proximal visual supports seem to fuel initiation, especially in emerging language stage students. So let's end off with the conversational stage. You have a child who's speaking in full conversational discourse. We need to make sure as we follow this arrow down that we're providing visual supports for what to say, when to talk, and how to engage. We need to make sure that all students have duplicate sets of visual support so they can reference during their group instructions and they have multiple options for how to express themselves. They can point to things, they might have a clipboard that they write on, they might talk to their peers and so forth. Then at the bottom, the opportunities we might provide is to balance the teacher-led discourse with student-led discourse. Maybe there's peer interactions, turn and talks, peer group collaboration, and so forth. And so I wanted to share this example of a conversational uh, literacy-based instruction where we are fostering initiation by making sure peers interact with each other. There's turn and talks, and they've got proximity to visuals. This is the learning standard. They're learning about similes, idioms, and metaphors. And in order to show what they know about these particular uh, concepts, they have to get out of the metaphor escape room. They have to get out of the simile escape room, and they have to get out of the idiom escape room. But they can do it in small groups of two or three peers. So they've got each other, and they've also got these access to these visual tools that reminds them how to derive meaning of metaphors or idioms and how to think about the context cues and other things that they might need to understand and therefore show what they know. So that all of the teams have access to visual tools. And once they solve it, they have to put the right thing into the computer so that they can get out of that escape room and move on to the next escape room. So it seems that we've stimulated their interest in this playful context, the competition, the game they're playing, but we're fostering their initiation with this peer interaction, the turn and talks and all of these visual supports that you see. B is one. B. Oh, no, D. Sorry. Yeah, D. D. Dog. Uh, and I believe D is one. Okay, and then below D is the right one. Yeah, it's one. Below D is the right one? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
so that's under one number two. I think it was B. B? Because Mr. Yeah. Smith won. Mr. Yeah. Smith is not my Yeah, because William Fly is like very good winner. So, so we're, we're going with B? Uh, yeah. Okay, so B would be 5. Right now, no, 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 no. So, She work hard. Where's that though? Oh, she hope her dad happy. She hope her dad happy. She hope she good happy. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's B. It's B. It's B. Cause have good luck. Better than it means like good luck. Yes. Yeah, so it's B. So what did B go to? Oh, she said 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 one of the things I hope you caught by me showing you pretty much every group in that classroom is that each of them working in pairs or smaller groups, each of them having access to the visual tools that they need to really figure this out on their own, and it seemed to foster their initiation. They were showing what they knew to each other and working together collaboratively. I was really struck by the level of investment of the students. I'd come right up to their, literally their faces with my camera and they just didn't even care about me because they had to get out of this escape room. But I also noticed their initiation. Each of the students was showing what they knew about how to derive meanings of metaphors or similes or idioms because they were like, okay, well, if it's a landslide, it must be a big thing. And so they were really learning about how to derive meaning from language and how to use their tools to show what they know. So I wanted you to see that as an example of getting kids working together and using visual supports to support their initiation. So this is our reflection time. I want to make sure that you use this time to actually read section C of the Seek's Quick Reference Tool. In our first part of our three-part module, you wrote down some ideas that you already use to foster initiation in your learning environments. So this is a chance to really affirm what you already do and maybe to write down things that you're already doing to enhance literacy instruction in your classrooms. Think about before words, emerging language, and conversational. Take some time to read this and write down any strategies that you're already using to fuel initiation. So again, go ahead and pause this recording for about five minutes or so, take that time to read and to reflect, and we will see where we'll go next. So hopefully you took some time to reflect. If you are looking for additional strategies to foster student initiation in classroom lessons, I'd encourage you to go back to section C of the SEEKS Quick Reference Tool in order to see if there's things that you can be doing to increase students showing what they know through different options, as well as different opportunities that are sensitive to their developmental stage. So hopefully I've gotten you excited and eager to stay tuned for part three of our three-part series. We've talked about the why and we've talked about the what. The why social engagement is so important, how to measure it, and now we've talked about the what instructional strategies seem to foster investment, independence, and initiation. When we come back together for our third series of this three-part video module series, we're going to talk about the how. How do we mentor each other to fuel engagement? How do we inspire each other, energize each other, and refuel each other to think about different ways to modify our learning environment so students are compelled to be invested in independence and initiation? So stay tuned and I'll see you back at part three of three.